Well, hello and welcome to all of you who are watching our service online here at FBC Salinas. Wherever you are, whatever your time you're watching this, we're so glad that you are joining us today. Just a few announcements for you as uh, before we start off our service. The first is all of the emails that we have at this church. If you have any questions in regards to any sort of different ministry, here are all of our emails. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. We would love to answer any questions that you may have. And along with emails, you may have received a survey that we put together um, via email. Also, you might have gotten a text and you will be receiving it in the mail. We wanted to put together a survey to make sure that what we're doing here has been effective in this crazy season that we're in. Uh, so please, if you have received that survey, fill it out as quickly as possible and get it back to us. We would like to have them returned and completed by September 6th. That's next Sunday. Um, so please, you received it in an email, in a text, as well as in the mail. So complete that by September 6th. And as you probably already know, we have many different worship options for you each weekend. The first is uh, the recording on YouTube um, that is available starting at 8 a.m. Sunday mornings. The next is an interactive online service. You can be a part of that at FBC Salinas. Dot online dot church, and that's at 10.30 Sunday mornings. It's a great way to watch the service online in the comfort of your own home while also being able to interact and chat with others. And our last opportunity is 10.30 Sunday mornings out in the back lawn. Uh, so far, it's just been a great experience being able to worship outside out there and seeing uh, all of you who join us there. So those are the different worship options each weekend. And lastly, uh, as September is just right around the corner, which is just crazy, uh, we'll be starting off our different family ministries. So the first is starting this upcoming Thursday, September 3rd, our adult ministry led by Pastor John will be starting, again, their long look at Luke series, and that will be via Zoom every Thursday night starting this Thursday, September 3rd at 6 o'clock. The Zoom ID will be sent out to you beforehand. Uh, it's just a great time to study the book of Luke that they are doing. The next ministry is our Journey Youth Ministry. Adam Matthew has put together so many amazing opportunities for the students to get involved and uh, join the Bible study that he is doing. He will be posting different videos and messages on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You can find those by searching for FBC Journey. And then every Thursday night, uh, starting this Thursday, September 3rd at 7 o'clock, he'll be doing a Bible study uh, through Zoom, and the Zoom ID will be sent out to you before that as well. If you have any questions on what he's doing, any questions on how your student can get involved in these different opportunities, don't hesitate to contact Adam at his email. And lastly, uh, for children's ministries, we're doing it a little differently so they don't have to do it online. Every Sunday morning, starting on September 6th, they will be meeting at 9 a.m. out front of our church in the little courtyard area to do their Awana program in person. And that is for regular attending FBC families. Uh, they will be uh, socially distanced as best as possible, and that will be outside right on the courtyard area um, at 9 a.m. Sunday mornings, Lorraine and her team will be leading them through the Awana program. If you have any questions on how your kid can get involved in that, feel free to contact Lorraine, and she'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. And now as we start off our service, I'd like to uh, turn it over to one of our elders here, Jamal Shepard, as he opens us up in prayer. Amen. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you have brought us through in this very, very tumultuous year. Uh, we will never forget 2020, Father. But Father, the thing that we remember the most is that you brought us through it to this point. And it's just August, Lord God. It's the eighth month of the year. And we have faith and trust that as you brought us through the first eight months, Lord, you will bring us through the rest of it. And so, Father, we extol your name. We are so grateful for the grace and mercy that you've given to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us a great opportunity to be a, a great and strong witness to other people in the community, to Christians and non-Christians alike, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you will continue to empower us with your spirit, that we will continue to do great things in this city, 
Um, bless our leadership in the church, our senior pastor and the elders. Bless all of the congregants. Bless people who will eventually make their way back into our building in due time, Lord. In all things, Lord, we, we give thanks to you and we recognize you as king. Um, we understand the word corona, um, which means crown in Spanish, Father. But we know that you are the only king and you are crowned, Lord. And we will overcome through you, Lord, because you have overcome all things. We pray for those who may be sick or may be under the weather. Father, we pray that you restore their health and bring them back into a full state of well-being, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And also, as is our tradition in this church, by way of encouragement, um, even though this is not Easter, we always like to remind fellow believers that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.
Jamal, always good to have you with us, buddy. So it's a great, uh, great to have you helping us out uh, in this service. This past week, I received a text from a, a good friend of my family back in Kansas City. As a matter of fact, this individual was pretty influential in in helping my my dad come to know Christ. And his name's Rich Mann, and he sent me a text. and And the text opened with this line. He says, "John, I want you to know I'm praying for you. I believe the church is under attack." And and as I read what he was praying for me about, I first off I thanked him, thanked him profusely via text for for. Saying Sending that to me, but then this thought hit me. The church is always under attack because we, the church, are advancing forward for the kingdom of God. And Satan is not happy about that at all. And one of the things that has struck me, especially this week, was that in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all that's going on in the world right now, I want to say this. I don't think the church has ever been praying more than it is right now, at least in recent history. And perhaps in the midst of this, and I don't know God's grand schemes perfectly by any stretch, but what struck me was this, was that perhaps that's what we were supposed to be doing in the first place was praying. Turning to him, asking him for guidance here and asking him for guidance there because Jesus said this, even the gates of hell shall not prevail. That is power. There's power when we come into the presence of God, turning to him saying, we want to be your people. We want to be used by you. So as we come into this time of praying, it is my prayer that we would keep that in mind, that we would not quiver in fear, but that we would 
go forth confidently, not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ. And I believe that God hears our prayers. I believe that he is doing amazing things. And now as we pray, may we reflect on that. And more importantly, may we ask and continue to seek his guidance, his will, his kingdom to come. Father, we ask now in this time as we spend time praying, specifically praying, Lord, we confess to you that this year has thrown us for a loop, as Jamal alluded to earlier. And in the midst of being thrown for a loop, we come to this conclusion that you're still on the throne, that we can come to you and lay our burdens at the cross, that we can come to you and, and know with great confidence that you hear us and that there is a purpose because you live. And we can come to you knowing that you roar as a lion and yet are as compassionate as a lamb because you are the one true God. So, Father, have mercy on us for those times when we try and go it alone, for those times when we try to do things without seeking your grace and seeking your will to be accomplished. Have mercy on us at this time. And Father, we come to you now thanking you for the way at least the wildfires in this particular area have continued to be more and more contained. We thank you for the firefighters. We thank you for the first responders. We thank you for all those involved in this. And we continue to pray that you will give them good health. And we continue to pray for various families who have been displaced that they would know that you're right there with them and that you are going to take care of them. We thank you that all the families that were affected by the fire in, at FBC Salinas are back home and they're safe and they're doing okay. We thank you for that and we continue to pray that you will provide protection, you will continue to provide what's needed to take care of these other wildfires in this state. And Father, we come to you and continue praying for, for grace, for wisdom, for discernment. During this particular season of, of COVID, we would ask that you would remind us that you are still on the throne. And Lord, we pray for those who are seeking a vaccine and seeking the right course to go. We would ask that you would give them wisdom that you would give them insight that is only from you, and that in the midst of this, that Christ followers would rise up and say, we know the one who will walk us through these days, and his name is Jesus. So Lord, guide those people on the front lines, guide the people, the first responders, guide, guide them and, and protect them, and may they uh, come to know you if they don't know you, and if they do know you, may they be beacons for you in this time as they care for people. Lord, we continue praying for our country, a country that uh, you have uh, been at work at in, in, in a long time, just as you've been at work in this world in, for a long time. We would ask that you would walk us through these days Lord, I pray for an end to senseless violence. I pray for an end to the divisiveness. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your reign would be seen in the way Christ's followers live their lives and that people would come to know you and that instead of lashing out with hatred, that your grace would win the day and that your grace would bring healing, your grace would bring forgiveness, your grace would bring hope to this country. And Father, we pray specifically for people in this community of faith, FBC Salinas. 
We pray specifically for those who are struggling with their health right now. We would ask that you would bring healing to them. We think of Kevin Whittier. We think of Margie Coe. We think of, of others in, our, in, in this community of faith that you, would, uh, that you would bring healing, that you would bring full restoration to them at this particular time, Father. And Lord, we know this, that we're not the only church in Salinas that is proclaiming your good news. We know that there are plenty of other Christ-following churches and organizations that are proclaiming that. And we bring before you right now Salinas River Community Church, led by Pastor Rahelio Perez. Thank you for my brother, for my friend, and I thank you for this church that, that uh, we had the privilege of, of planting a number of years ago. And we continue to pray that you would grow that ministry that you would guide Rahelio and that you would encourage him and strengthen him and use him for your glory at this time. So Lord, we lift all of these requests to you, trusting that your will will be accomplished, that your will will be done. And we pray, oh Father, that you would guide us and help us to be a generous people a people that realizes how much you've given to us and that we would then respond with, with generous hearts and generous lives as well. So Lord, take the gifts that we give to you and use them, multiply them, and expand the reach of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, remind you of uh, your gifts and tithes and offerings that they go to support the ministry of FBC Salinas and not simply this community of Christ followers, but various organizations and missionaries that we support throughout the world. And so we thank you for your generosity. We continue to ask that you would continue contributing as God uh, blesses you. And you can do that via bill pay through your, through your bank. You can do that by mailing in, the, uh, mailing in your gift. Or you can even bring it by the church and drop it off here. We're here almost every single day. So one of those ways, feel free to do that and go to our website as well. There's a donate button there. It's fbcsalinas.com. You can go there and donate as well. I want to say thank you for your ongoing generous financial support of the ministry that we have the privilege of doing here at FBC Salinas. Thank you. Throughout Scripture, God's people are often referred to as sheep, and we'll again see that truth hold true again as we unpack this next section of, of the Sermon on the Mount. And because I'm such a creative individual, I thought I would provide you a little did you know, and the topic is sheep. Did you know these different things about sheep? First off, did you know that sheep have rectangular pupils? I don't, that sort of freaks me out a little bit, but get this. They have rectangular pupils, and those rectangular pupils allow them to have upwards of 320-degree field of vision. Pretty much, they can see everything unless it's directly behind them. And given the fact that sheep are pretty defenseless, it's important to know what's around them at all times. Did you know this, that sheep have scent glands in front of their eyes and on their feet? Again, I don't know how that all works, but God in his creative genius put scent glands in those locations so sheep can smell all types of different, different uh, aromas and, 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 and fragrances. I don't know how that happens, but it does. Here's another one that gets a little bit more practical for us, especially for Tatum and others who knit. One pound of wool, one pound of wool can make up to 10 miles of yarn. 10 miles of yarn out of one pound of wool. That's a lot of yarn. Did you know this? That sheep can self-medicate. 
They use plants and other substances that hold no nutritional value whatsoever, but they use that to help prevent them and to help also treat diseases, prevent diseases as well as treat diseases. Sheep can do that. Did you know that one sheep can produce between 2 to 30 pounds of wool a year? And did you know that sheep can recognize up to 50 other sheep faces and remember them for two years? For the last almost four years, when I've talked about sheep in the Bible, I've, I've made fun of them. Yet after I read this list and, and was researching this, I sit there and think, sheep are pretty fascinating. And Jesus Christ understands this, and Jesus Christ refers to this as he continues walking us through the Sermon on the Mount. And I invite you now to turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to start at verse 15. And Jesus knows this, sheep are fascinating, but he also knows this, that sheep can be led astray quite easily. Listen to what he says here in verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Father, we pray now as we come to this time of looking at your word, we pray that you would open our eyes that we can see that you would open our minds that we can understand, that you would open our ears that we can hear, and that you would open our hearts that we would be transformed. May your Holy Spirit move freely through us, and may your Holy Spirit bring to mind those things that you want them to hear and need them to hear, and that they would not hear anything that I say, but only what it is that you want them to hear. And Lord Jesus Christ, may you, May you receive all glory. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Watch out. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Looks can be deceiving. And Jesus Christ is addressing that right here when he says, watch out. This is a command. We need to be alert to this. Jesus wants you and me to use our brains. For some reason, people think, well, well, when you come to know Jesus, you get to turn off your brain. No, that's not the truth at all. If anything else, we now have to use our brains. We have to use them more fully because Jesus Christ is wanting us to be distinctly different and we need to be able to think through what that looks like and how we then live it out. I was very intentional when I titled this series Distinctly Different. And the intentionality was this because we need to be thinking all the time about how we are to be distinctly different in a culture, in a world that is increasingly going off the rails. And it's in that being distinctly different that people can say there's truth, there's life, there's hope. You see, the way a wolf operates is a wolf has a motto, and the motto is this, do as I say, not as I do. A wolf cares nothing about anyone else except the wolf. 
And there are false prophets everywhere. There were false prophets in Jesus' day. As a matter of fact, if you, if you want to think through this a little bit, in the Gospels, one of the main things that he's dealing with from in, in every single one of the Gospels are false prophets. And a quick little tangent, when I'm talking about prophets here, oftentimes we sit there and think, well, prophets are, are people that foresee into the future. That's somewhat of an element. But, but as you read Scripture, a prophet is simply taking a message that God has given them and letting it get and, and communicating that to those who hear. So when Jesus is talking about false prophets, he's talking about people who have a or who are giving false information about who God is and what God wants to do. The Pharisees, frankly, I think you could probably call them false prophets. These these imposters that came before Christ, that claimed, that made all types of claims, were false prophets. The timeliness and the timelessness of Jesus' message here in the Sermon on the Mount is abundantly clear here as well. Because false prophets are a current reality for us. In the midweek refresher video, I talked about you know, how we're going to launch forward in this. And, and I talked about friendship. And then, and then at the end of the week, when I sent out an email, I asked this question. I said, how much time do you spend on the internet? And I asked that question because of this. There are false prophets all over the internet. People that can take something that looks really true and they can twist it just a little bit and all of a sudden it sends you down a path that is not healthy. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. One of the false prophecies that is going on, and it isn't simply a, a new thing, it's been going on for a long time, is, is false views of who Jesus Christ is. And so there are a number of things that I could talk about as far as what, what false teaching is and, and things like that, but I want us to take a look at what, how other belief systems view Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to hit all of them, but I'm going to hit some pretty big ones. The first is this, Judaism. How does Judaism view Jesus Christ? They view Jesus as not the Messiah. They are still awaiting the, awaiting the Messiah. Fascinating thing about Matthew's gospel is that it is written to Jewish, to Jewish people back in that day. And the reason why, as you, as you start reading through Matthew's gospel from the very beginning, he gives you prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. And at the end of each one, he says, and thus was fulfilled. What he's doing there is saying Jesus really is the Messiah. Judaism continues to believe that Jesus is not the Messiah. Islam, it's been in the news for a long time. Islam believes that Jesus is a prophet, just as Muhammad is a prophet. Jesus Christ is, yes, he may do some really great things, but yet he is simply a prophet. Let's, let's talk briefly about Hinduism. Hinduism has multiple gods, hundreds if not thousands of gods, Jesus simply is one of those gods. He is not the only God. He's one of many. Let's take a quick look at Buddhism. Jesus is simply a wise teacher. Great comments. Great insights into human nature. Great insights into what's going on in the world. Looks very appealing. But that's where it stops. And then lastly is this, and this is a very broad category, the New Age beliefs. Jesus is an enlightened master, that you and I could become enlightened masters like him. All of these things are out there, and they look so appealing. And one of the things that I've noticed in the last number of years, and not just the last number of years, but over the course of the past number of decades, is that people continue to come up with all these different types of, of, of desires to think that all roads lead to heaven. All roads lead to life. But yet, what does Jesus have to say about who he is? 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are abundantly clear that Jesus Christ knows exactly who he is. He says, I and the Father are one. Jesus is God. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ provides that salvation. Jesus was called a great rabbi, and yet he took that and said, if you believe me, you will have life. What Jesus has to say about himself is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not a truth, not a life. The way, the truth, the life. Watch out for false prophets. One of the things that I want to encourage you to do is this, is that pay attention to what people have to say about Jesus Christ. Because what they have to say about Jesus Christ says an awful lot about what they have to say about your life and their life as well. Notice what he says here in verse 16. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And I, I thought this was rather, this was a really great thing that he does. He says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Good teaching nourishes one's life. Talks about grapes and figs. What does bad teaching do? It's thistles and thorn bushes. No nutritional value whatsoever. Pay attention to the teaching. I invite you as, you, as as you hear me proclaim your word or Adam Matthew or someone else proclaim your word, examine what we're saying. Because we are responsible to give good teaching. And then Jesus transitions and he says this in verse 17, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree cannot bear fruit. But a bad tree, sorry, bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Jesus then comes into this, what I call, and this is, very, uh, this, this is not in the Greek, I call it the yum versus the yuck. Yummy fruit versus yucky fruit. And Jesus understands this, that all teaching has repercussions. Bad teaching has repercussions. And what is that bad teaching? It produces bad fruit. Good teaching has reper repercussions. And what is that? Good fruit. Jesus understands this full well. He's not telling us anything we don't know. That's why he says in verse 17, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. So I've taken a look at some different belief systems and what they have to say about Jesus Christ. And perhaps you're saying, well, Pastor John, how do we know what good teaching looks like? Let me give you three pointers real quickly, and I think this will help you. And not simply when you come into God's word with what's going on here, but also just in life in general. Because God desires us to be distinctly different in this world. And if we are going to watch out for false prophets, we need to be able to critically look at what's going on. So just three points, and, and there are probably plenty of others that I could come up with. But I just want to give you three here. Good teaching, how to spot it. First is this. Is it consistent with the Bible? There is no other document in human history that has been examined more thoroughly than the Bible. Nothing. Nothing comes close to it. And every single time it's been examined, the conclusion is this, is that there is a consistent message proclaimed from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 22. It's true. It's reliable. So how do you know good teaching? Is it consistent with God's word? Number two, is it nourishing? 
Is it something that is helpful in my life? Is it something that prompts me to be more and more in line with the person that God has called me to be? Is it something that brings joy? Is it something that gives me peace in the midst of turmoil? Is it something that gives me hope when, when things look very down and down and, and, and dark? Is it something that, that, that lifts me up when I'm feeling down? Is it something that comforts me when I'm grieving and mourning? Is it something that, and frankly, hear me now, is it something that convicts me when I'm doing something wrong? That's nourishment. You know this about me. I'm not a fan of vegetables. But yet, you know what? I might not enjoy them, but there are, there's nourishment there. Nourishment that I need. No one enjoys being convicted of wrongdoing or, or of their sinful behavior. No one enjoys that, yet it's nourishing. So number one, is it consistent with the Bible? Number two, is it nourishing? And number three, does your understanding or appreciation of Jesus Christ increase or decrease? Good teaching should expand your appreciation. Good teaching should expand your understanding. Good, te good teaching should, should blow your mind about who Jesus Christ is. One of the things that's happened in my life over the years is this, is that as I continue walking with Jesus Christ, I get to know him better, and yet I realize there's so much more to him than I, than I ever thought possible. Is it consistent with the Bible? Is it nourishing? Does your understanding and appreciation of Jesus Christ increase? If it doesn't, it's bad teaching. It's bad fruit. It's yucky. And bad fruit leads to bad outcomes. Just does. Bad fruit always makes people feel sick. Bad fruit always, always leads people to, to not, do, not being able to function at the best of their ability. Look what Jesus says. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree, get this, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In essence, what Jesus is saying is bad teaching, it's worthless. It has nothing to offer. Every good tree bears good fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Good fruit is good tasting. You're going to see on the screen right now, this is uh, the orange tree that's in the backyard in our house at, in Scottsdale. And we lived there for 16 years, and, and my, uh, my daughter and her family live there now. And, and, and this tree, this one tree, was an orange tree, and it produced fruit. Real funny story we had moved in and we had i had we were taking care of this tree and 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 we had our first it was probably two two years in because when we came in the tree wasn't doing that well and so we we somewhat revived it i guess if you want to call it that and this tree produced oranges like i had never seen before that tree that you're looking at in one year produced get this 1,241 oranges, that one tree. I spent hours picking them. I was exhausted by the time it was done picking them, and they were all over the backyard. And I said to my daughters, to Stephanie and Heidi, and I said, listen, I'll pay you to put those in bags. My oldest daughter, Stephanie, is a little bit different than Heidi, and Stephanie looked at me and she said, how much? Now, I didn't know how many oranges were on the ground, and I said, listen, I'll give you guys five bucks a bag, and each bag has 50 in them. So I think it was something like that. Anyway, Stephanie says, you got a deal. Needless to say, 
they went to town and they wiped me out financially. The point is this, is that they had a blast doing this. And the point is, the, the other point is this, is that good fruit multiplies. Good fruit makes an impact in people's lives. And the good fruit that Jesus Christ is talking about is this list, and, and frankly, it's part of a list that Paul comes up with in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Does the person that you're hearing the teaching from, does their life line up with what they're saying? Good teaching produces good fruit. Is the person's teaching lining up with the way they live their lives? By their fruit, you will recognize them. Watch out for false prophets. By their fruit, you will recognize them. You'll recognize the bad, and you'll also recognize the good. Remember, use our brains. Be discerning. Then he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This section of Scripture, this section of the Sermon on the Mount should cause us to be a little uneasy. Because what Jesus has done here is he's talked about looks can be deceiving. Then he talks about yummy fruit versus yucky fruit. And then he comes to this conclusion and it and it's, revolves around this. Knowing about something versus knowing something. That's what he's addressing here. The conclusion, as he begins wrapping this up, and we'll wrap it up next week, the wrapping up that he's doing here is Jesus is being very loud and clear. It's one thing to know about me. It's an entirely different thing to know me. There are all types of imposters out there. Look what these people say in verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? But they're forgetting something. They're forgetting what Jesus says at the very beginning. Only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, all these things that they listed, casting out demons, prophesying their name, doing miracles, those are fantastic things. Those are great things to do. And is it God's, God's will is to restore all the time. But yet, and we'll see here in just a few moments, what, what, what happens when we start playing around with this stuff? To do the will of the Father, and this is where I think the clarity comes into play. To do the will of the Father means this, that it brings glory to Jesus Christ. It brings glory to the Godhead rather than the person. Let that sink in. There are a lot of great things going on in the world at a variety of times, but yet who's getting the glory? Is it God getting the glory or is it the person getting the glory? That's what Jesus is addressing here. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In essence, what's the will of the Father? To bring glory to him. That's why we're here. And the other question is this, who benefits? Does God benefit or does a person benefit? It's about God benefiting that person. It's a combination thing. It's not one or the other. It's God working together here. That's what Jesus is addressing. And remember what I said. When these people came up to him in verse 22, they said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? These people were playing games with God. False prophets, bad teaching plays games with God and it always leads to destruction. 
I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 19 and listen to what happens here, starting at verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke, notice this, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and notice what happens, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Playing games with God. Playing games with the name of God is what these people were doing. They knew about Jesus, But they did not know Jesus. Notice what he says here in verse 23. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Perhaps there are no four, there are there are four words no more painful than those words right there in Scripture. I never knew you. Is it possible is it possible that you've been playing games with God? Is it possible that you know a whole lot about Jesus but you don't know Jesus? Verses 21 to 23 are a heart check. Do you know Jesus or do you simply know about Jesus? Knowing Jesus changes your life forever. Knowing about Jesus is playing games. And that leads to destruction. Many of us know about Billy Graham. Billy Graham had a great friend by the name of Charles Templeton. Matter of fact, they were this duo, this dynamic duo of gospel proclaiming individuals. Started their ministries in the 1940s. And people, get this, people believe that Charles Templeton was the one who would overturn the world with the gospel. He was a more polished speaker. He had a great way of communicating. He had a great way with people. But over the course of time, Charles Templeton, who was working and serving alongside Billy Graham, over the course of time, Charles Templeton decided that he would go a little bit of a different route. And the result was absolutely devastating. Charles Templeton knew all types of truth about Jesus Christ, yet did not know Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, before Charles Templeton's passing. A person by the name of Lee Strobel who wrote some great books uh, for the uh, uh, Case of Christ, The Case of Faith. I encourage you to read those books. They're great books. He interviewed Charles Templeton and listened to these comments that Templeton makes towards the end of Templeton's life. Strobel's question is, and how do you assess this, this Jesus? 
It seemed like the next logical question I should ask him, but I wasn't ready for the response it would evoke. Templeton's body language softened. It was as if he suddenly felt relaxed and comfortable in talking about an old and dear friend. His voice, which at times had displayed such a sharp and insistent edge, now took on a melancholy and reflective tone. His guard seemingly down, he spoke in an unhurried pace, almost nostalgically, carefully choosing his words as he talked about Jesus. He was, Templeton began, the greatest human being who has ever lived. He was a moral genius. His ethical sense was unique. He was intrinsically the wisest person that I've ever encountered in my life or in my readings. His commitment was total and led to his own death, much to the detriment of the world. What could one say about him except that this form was, it was a form of greatness? You sound like you really care about him, Strobel said. Templeton's response, well, yes. He is the most important thing in my life. I know it may sound strange, but I have to say, I adore him. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, I learned from Jesus. Yes, yes, and tough. Just look at Jesus. He castigated people. He was angry. People don't think of him that way, but they don't read the Bible. He had a righteous anger. He cared for the oppressed and exploited. There's no question that he had the highest moral standard, the least duplicity, the greatest compassion of any human being in history. There have been many other wonderful, wonderful people, but Jesus is Jesus. Oh, but no, he said slowly. He's the most. He stopped and started again. In my view, he is the most important human being who has ever existed. And that's when Templeton uttered the words I never expected to hear from him. Templeton continues and says, and if I may put it this way, I miss him. With that, tears flooded his eyes. He turned his head and looked downward, raising his left hand to shield his face from me. His shudders bobbed as he wept. Templeton fought to compose himself. I could tell it wasn't like him to lose control in front of a stranger. He sighed deeply and wiped away a tear. And after a few more awkward moments, he waved his hands dismissively. Finally, quietly, but adamantly, he insisted, enough of that. Charles Templeton. Billy Graham working together to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Charles Templeton fell for the wolf in sheep's clothing, knew about Jesus, but didn't know Jesus. Charles Templeton died in 2001, a few months after the release of a book called Farewell to God. Billy Graham went on proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ until the day he breathed his last on February 21st, 2018. It is estimated that more than 3.2 million people have responded to the invitation that Billy Graham gave to accept Jesus Christ as a personal savior. Charles Templeton knew about Jesus. Billy Graham knew Jesus. I ask you right now, do you know Jesus or do you know about Jesus? There is no greater joy for a pastor than to talk with somebody about Jesus Christ, not just about Jesus Christ, but to talk about what it means to know Jesus Christ. 
And it would give me no bigger joy than having you email me at john at fbcsalinas.com and and say, hey, I have some questions. I'm interested in in knowing about, I'm I'm interested in knowing Jesus Christ. I know plenty about him, but I want to know him. Can you help me here? You can email somebody else in in the church. You can email our elders. You can email somebody else on staff. Because the last thing you want to hear is this. I never knew you. Bad teaching leads to bad consequences. And those bad consequences are the words, I never knew you. Is today, is right now that time that you can know Jesus Christ, know his forgiveness know his healing, know his good fruit of forgiveness and peace and purpose and hope. He's there. I invite you to turn to him. I want to ask Jamal and Heidi to come back up and as, as you're taking some time now to reflect on what you've heard, in a few moments we're going to sing and And as we sing, may we rejoice in the good news of Jesus Christ and the good news that he wants us to know him, that he wants us to be distinctly different. Would you join me now as we pray? Father, in the midst of these words, it strikes me that we know a whole lot about Jesus Christ at times but we need to know Jesus. We need to know that power. We need to know that grace. We need to know that forgiveness. We need to know that peace. We need to know that love. We need to know Jesus. So Lord, if there is anyone out there that's listening to this service, that's watching this service that does not know you, I pray right now that you'd stop them in their tracks and say, come to know me. Come to know me now. So move in their midst, and and Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that they would respond and shoot off an email or a text and say, I want to know Jesus. May that happen. Lord, use this church to know you better, to help people know you better, to not know about you, but to know you to know Jesus Christ and his love and his forgiveness. Lord, bring people to yourself. And for those who need to know you, may they come to know you at this very time. Move in our midst, Lord, and help us to be people that are more than just knowing about you. Help us to be a people that truly knows you so that we can be distinctly different in this world. May the fruit that we produce be fruit that brings glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I invite you to sing, to sing loudly, to sing with great joy as we celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us.
is truly amazing. That grace is amazing. And I like the little ending you guys put together there. That was a very nice touch, you know, so it was good. Hey, if you have questions about Jesus Christ and you want to know Jesus Christ, we invite you to reach out to us, shoot us an email, send us a text, whatever, call us, set up an appointment. Because knowing Jesus is truly the biggest decision you can make in your life. If you're struggling through stuff right now, he's, he's the one. There's all types of other teaching out there that will tell you this or tell you that. Jesus Christ will tell you the truth, and that truth will set you free. I invite you to know Jesus. Let us know how we can help you in that. And know this, he cares so much about us that he's willing to tell us the truth, and he's going to care for us and walk us through whatever comes our way. And why does he do that? Because he cares for us. No doubt about it. I love you. I thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. God bless. Have a great day. Bye-bye.